Welcome back to another happy hour, man. Good to hey. see you. Yeah, back in town this week. Um, it's been uh, it's been a long. Am I, I, I tagged in there? Let's say okay. here. Uh, do you want, tagged? Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, all right, we're getting everything ready. There's Amanda. Oh, yeah. Amanda, good to see you. Glad you could be the first uh, yeah. in here. So, uh, let's see. We got a busy week. Uh, we've had going on this week, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a lot of stuff going on. Uh, catching up uh, with some contracts. Uh, rates are moving. Rates Home are moving are heavy, aren't they? Are going up. Uh, a lot of buyers out there. Not enough. Not enough uh, sellers. That's right. Oh. Not enough. What's not going enough. on with that? Uh, well, I tell you, I've, I haven't seen it, you know, as we say every week. I mean, it's getting nuttier and nuttier. I mean, yeah. they are literally, we are at lows we haven't seen. I mean, 4,900 houses uh, on the market right now in the Birmingham area. I mean, just to put that again in perspective, we were at almost 10,000 houses on the market in 2011. We've lost 50% of the inventory. And I'm telling you what, I have not seen it as crazy as it is right now where you could, hey, if you're a home seller, you're easily selling your house in this market. But by golly, you might be living in that apartment that you lived in 20 years ago again, at least temporarily while waiting you find on, the waiting new Waiting on the new one. house to come. That's true. Yes. I, that's Absolutely. True. Hey, Adrian. Well, I've got I got some stuff I want to talk about. You're that. looking good. But uh, we've got, uh, what about Amazon? Well, hey, Amazon, $1 billion purchase of Ring doorbells. By the way, if anybody didn't know this, Ring doorbells is a reject of Shark Tank. I don't know. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I remember seeing them on there. That's awesome. Do you really? You remember the actual episode? Yeah. Was there yeah. anybody that almost took them? I, no, I don't remember specifically, but I remember that was a it was a very cool thing, and just to see people post out there, um, and I've seen this on social media, people posting videos of at their house, the the ring video at their house with people walking up is uh, it's very cool. It's, it's very what's cool. really crazy is the reason Amazon did it because the porch thieves, these people that follow UPS, in case you didn't know, what what ends up happening is these these people travel behind the UPS guy. And then wait for him to drop a package off. Hey, go, it's probably in the swanky neighborhoods. And then once they drop it off, they go steal it, right? Yeah. So Amazon's, goods. Amazon's big deal here was they got the technology now. They bought a lock manufacturer about a year ago. I forget the electronic lock company. It's probably called Amazon Locks now, right? Uh, and then so what they're going to do is they're going to basically make it easy on purpose for... Uh, the UPS guy to be yes. able to open your door, mm -hmm. throw your package in, so the porch thief can't get it, and yes. it'll be like one-time toads and those type of things. Yeah, they're not going to stop cool. and drink your beer. That'd be very cool. Yeah, yeah, that would be super cool. Just allow them to get in and out uh, without you being worried about somebody coming in and, and taking your stuff. You know that it's the the UPS guy, so there'd be uh, accountability there. Right. It's a, you know what's really amazing is that they, they're you you know and the, we're probably sidetracking a little bit here from real estate. But what's fascinating is what happening is Amazon's investing in a lot of these technology companies in their infancy and hoping that one hits so that they can they're really using Alexa as their model because what they're probably looking at from what I've read is a subscription model down the road where uh, Darren James said best show online. Yes. <laughs> hey, great taste. Anyway, but where you'll bundle for so much per month security, you'll get a free Alexa, you'll get a free security system, you'll get free Prime, all for a monthly price of $300 or whatever it may be. So it's going to be interesting to see well, how all this shakes out. I think it's amazing to see how technology changes things. Uh, obviously, we know that th this is the techn technological age, right? And from an online bookstore to uh, owning uh, groceries now, hmm. uh, uh, delivery, uh, all these technology companies, all these things that Amazon is getting into, um, started out as an online bookstore, right? All that, and, and really, yeah. it's a supply chain that they, that they that they're really good at. It's that software yes. and that kind of thing. Yeah, they yeah they figured out how to deliver to the consumer and sell online better than anybody else, I believe. I, hey, it's going to be fun to watch because the the only person that benefits, I think, is the consumer. I mean, I really yeah. do think we do benefit. Now, you got to watch it that we don't want Amazon to get too powerful. Uh, I don't want them in the real estate game, for instance, or the mortgage game, but. You know, uh, whatever is good for the consumer, uh, I'll support. But let's, uh, th that's called a free failure. <laughs> that's right. Um, let's talk about, I know we, let's talk about rates because a lot of folks are asking uh, about rates again. I know we talk about it a lot, but 
Hey, that's what everybody wants to know about. Uh, yeah, and yeah. what's going on? You know, interest rates are moving. Um, I, I pulled up my, my Freddie Mac um, mortgage market survey today. We were up to 4.48, which is just an average um, interest rate um, from, a, from a, a market survey that they do. Um, it's up 48 basis points since the start of this year. And that has increased has increased for eight. Oh, no, you're talking weeks. What is a basis point? What do you? I mean, what are you really saying? Okay, there? so that's forty eight basis point is about half a percent. Okay, it's about half of a percent. It's about half of a point. So uh, a little bit below four to start the year, and now four point four three on average. So um, that's definitely an increase. So and that's increasing for eight consecutive weeks. Um, you know, a lot of people are concerned about this. I know. And it, there's typically some, some ebbs and flows in the market. So r- rates will move up, rates will come back down. This has been a pretty steady move up. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to bring some, some information in this week and just talk about what's really going on. Um, you know, everybody focuses on the negative stuff. You know, we don't, <laughs> it's easy for the media, yeah, right? We don't have enough buyers. Um, housing prices are getting out of hand. Interest rates are going up. The sky's falling. The sky. Right. Hey, that's yeah. exactly right. Everybody's freaking out. So, so I, I, I'm looking at some things. You know, we've got low unemployment right now. Right. That means more people are working. That means there Absolutely. is more money in the economy. There's more consumer spending. There's more consumer confidence. Um, we've got higher wages. You know, there's there's a lot of positive things in play that are causing these interest rates to move. That are causing the the number of people that own houses right now is mm-hmm. up, right? So um, the number of buyers getting into the market, you wouldn't have a ton of buyers getting into the market if things were bad. Right. If we had a ton of unemployment, if there was no wage growth. We've got uh, tax credits coming in, right? Or, or some changes to the tax codes that hopefully you'll, you'll bring home some more Except money. Except for Delta. Except for Delta. But uh, so so I've got some stuff here. Uh, listen, so, so mortgage rates are moving. I also looked at what do home prices do when rates move up? So the last time mortgage rates increased 1% over 12 month period was January 13 to January 14 from about 3.4 to 4.4. What happened to house prices during that span? They appreciated by 9.8%. Wow. Okay, and there was there was several other uh, time periods and interest rate right. increases and home prices appreciate during these times. Okay. <laughs> so I also wanted to pull up so anyway, it says mortgage rate rates have risen 1% on more than 10 times in the last 43 years with little impact on home sales and prices when the economy was also strong. Okay, so historically rising confidence, solid job growth and higher wages have more than offset reduced demand for housing resulting from higher mortgage rates. Right, but what, you know, and so what would you see is happening though when we have such low inventories though? Because I don't think we've seen this in a generation of folks where we have such low inventory, and so you have all this positivity going on in the market. What do you think? Because what a worry is, is that we're going to have, you know, you get to a certain point where everybody's in fear of, well, I'm not going to jump into the market, so I'm not going to put my yeah. house on the market. And that's what I think is going to happen. I think the market is going to work as the way it's supposed to. Okay, capital markets are, are built on supply and demand. Right. Buyers come in, buyers go out for different reasons. So let's say, for example, the buyer's gonna come in and if you if they can't get their house and they can't get their price and interest rates keep moving, then they're gonna back out. So I think at some point there's gonna be a, a return of the supply. Okay, I think demand is gonna stay strong for a little while. Some of these people may not be able to do anything, but supply is going to increase, I think, in the natural uh, season of a our normal business. seasonal yeah. business. The question is, though, do we return to normalcy year round? That will take years to happen. I, I really do think yeah, that. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of things to look at going forward. I mean, it, it's kind of exciting because there's a lot of things going on. There's change, uh, which is good. I mean, we have been in this rut since the, the crisis of 07, 08. Absolutely. So, and we're forcing builders. What's going to be really interesting to see is how, you know, construction starts and what they do to innovate because we one thing we can't get too far away from is the idea of a first time home buyer has to have a house to be a first time home buyer it's kind of like the minimum wage there's always going to be a minimum wage like there's always going to be a a entry level home yes and if the home builders go away from building any which we're seeing 
They they don't like building those entry level homes. Exactly. But we got to hope as land may get cheaper. That's who true. knows? So. Kid Rogers, Karen Barn, Karen Charles, good to see you guys. And Carrie Ballinger. Uh, and Bruno. Bruno always yep. gives me a hard time. I'm good to see that he's finally on here watching. Um, yep. I wanted Michael to read, Mayer. I wanted to read something City, else from uh, Atlanta, Ralph man. DeFranco. He's a chief economist, Arch Capital Service. It's premature to worry about a housing bubble. The typical warning signs, excessive debt levels, poor quality loans, exponentially increasing home prices, rising vacancy rates, and or poor affordability compared to the past, and a high number of internet searches on house flipping. Those things are not present. Okay, so last time we had a big problem, there were signs. Okay, That's right. we saw things come. Right now, all we have are prices going up. We do have a fight over the amount of houses on the market, but we don't have a lot of the poor decisions and the bad loans the that really to led, money, right? That, that really led to the problem. Before well, you, I remember when I, you things know, are healthier is what I'm saying. Well, when I was an attorney, I remember knowing we were in trouble when I saw a, a young lady come in, a single mother, who came in and was buying her third three hundred and fifty thousand dollar rental house. I knew we were in trouble because great woman had had a. Uh, <laughs> you're eyeballing me a little. <laughs> yeah, um, and when so she. She has no business owning three houses right. that are most people's normal single-family yes. home uh, on forty thousand dollars a year. Right, and so, but and that was because money was easy to get. Now, granted, she was probably paying an obscene interest rate, three, four points on the front end. Yeah, but we're not seeing that any this time around. Yeah, and I, and I think you know, money was easier <laughs> to get uh, as far as loan approvals and uh, banks were writing loans. Now, lo money right now is cheap. Okay, so don't confuse money being cheap and money being easy. Okay, those are two different things. Uh, right now, rates have been low, so rates have to move back up. This is just a natural progression in my mind, and that's what I'm trying to stress. I know a lot of people are talking about the, the, the concerns out there, but I think this is just a natural progression, and things are, things are a lot healthier than they were before. Yeah, and, and talk about, though, and the other thing, too, is we're seeing folks not get in over their heads in terms of their first home, nor, I mean, I remember the beach was hot. Remember? And and so we were battling that at that time, too. Mm -hmm. And so the, we don't have those pulls anymore, either, of trying to uh, get rich quick. Yeah, I think, well, I think I think people are more conservative. You know, they, they've, they saw what happened the last time. Um, and I think people since then have saved a little bit more money. And I think they're going to be a little bit slower. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like when you when you touch the iron as a kid. Right? The first, I know you did that a the bunch. First, the first time you touched it, it burned you. <laughs> oh, it did. The second time you looked at it, you were like, I'm probably not going to touch that. So a lot of these people that did dabble in the beach market, they did dabble in the condo area or, or the second home investment properties, they're, they're going to be a little bit slower to jump out there this time. And plus, they're going to have to have more skin in the game. They're going to have to have better credit. They're going to have to be a little bit more financially sound to get into that arena. It's still one of the best investments that you can make. Hey, Eva. It How is. are you? Very New York much. City. Are you in New York, Eva? Um, anyway, yeah. I mean, that is the thing. You, it, it's a solid investment if done right, where you really have some skin in the game. You and it's really a fun thing. It's a long term thing. That's yeah. I think ultimately at the end of the day, that was the problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's other things. I mean, uh, like I said, people are making more money right now. There's more people that are employed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, their their four hundred one ks are doing better. So, except today, uh, except today. Uh, but I wanted to read this real quick. Um, another uh, the Fitch report: U.S. home prices on track for five percent nominal gain, fourth consecutive year. All right, return to national price to their highest level since two thousand seven. The growth is driven by historically low mortgage rates and employment, plus solid population and personal income growth rates. All that stuff sounds really good, right? Yep, absolutely. It says a meaningful correction means that. Bad things would happen, like a, a, a turn down. Yep. A meaningful correction should only be triggered by an unexpected economic shock, war, yeah, or something, something huge. Okay, something huge. Other outside. Nick Saban of, getting fired. Yes. Which please, that if would you're just, watching Nick Saban, please, that hey, would just, just do us a favor. Kill real estate values in Alabama. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, I'm excited about it. Absolutely, and I, I think we're going to see it. You know. Uh, one of the other things that, you know that we're going to talk about today is a lot of the millennials have hit the market, and 
uh, they're they're getting older and they're they're buying houses and they're uh, oftentimes they're the ones bumping up into these houses uh, with uh, a lot of our parents' age houses. Yeah, they're uh, having challenges, huh? They're, they are having challenges, and a lot of it's communication challenges with because we are such a a paper and pen type. My generation, your generation, yeah. Gen X and above, uh, and. What are you seeing with these it's, millennials? It's, yeah, it's funny because, you know, uh, people will poke fun at millennials for, for being the, the, for growing up with all this technology, right? For, probably from about an average age of, what, 10? Yeah. You, you've got some kind of device, an iPad, uh, you know, at, at 12, 13, 14, kids already have iPhones. Absolutely. Um, so you've got information at, at your finger. You've at got the a ready. computer with you all the time, okay? Right. Um, and we're in a business that's a little bit still kind of old. Uh, we still are, are printing off paper contracts. You know, we're still hand initialing stuff and signing every page. And in the mortgage business, God forbid, we're asked for bank statements. What is that? A, huh? Or a pay stub. Who gets, the, and they'll say, hey, let me show it to stub. you on my phone. Yeah. Uh, that's not yeah. going to work. So, uh, you know? so I, and I, I love the, the ease of communication. I love not having the paper bank statements mailed to right. the house, right? Um, <laughs> but that, I think those are the types of things that, that we run into on our end that are, are not really a challenge, but I think it's a difference in, in understanding of sometimes they don't know how to get the pay stub or how to get bank statements. Or, or I know. use Credit Karma and I pulled my... my yeah, and, <laughs> doesn't and, that count? Right. And the, the example I, I like to use and call your laughs at me is I've ordered cat litter off of my television, but yet I've got a... <laughs> You know, still get a bank statement or something yeah. weird like that. So, you know, we've got this technology that's going. We've got a, a sports car in space. But yet, Elon Musk did. But, but yeah, you still got to look at a bank statement. So I, I, I can side with them there. I can understand. I can feel their pain on not being and, able and to you know what that, stuff. But, the, you know, one of the, the, the issues that I have mainly with them is this instant gratification. Simmer down just a little bit and let's... Look, people need to be thinking through things, and a lot of times that's what gets the millennials in trouble. This isn't a pick on the millennial time. It's it's saying you, this is a huge investment or a huge sale, whichever side yeah. you're on, and they got to understand that, that instant Thank gratification. You, Josh. Hey, Brisman. That's hey, what I'm talking from about. From one of the best attorneys ever, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I agree. I think, uh, you know, I think, I think it gets back to, um, you know, we were purchasing a home, you know, that's a large asset. And we're spending thousands of dollars. In our case, we're lo we're lending thousands of dollars. That's a lot of money, and you know, there's there's a lot of things that go into that. So it's a big deal. We, we're still negotiating. You don't take it personal, um, you know. Right, especially right now in the seller's market, there's going to be you know some negotiate a lot of negotiations, many times multiple offers, and and people get upset about that. You know, That's they, right. they, they and mom, hey, for the millennials, sometimes mama ain't gonna be there to pick you up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's no trophies at the end of this thing. Right. Uh, but, you know, the other thing, too, is, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in that thing, in a, in, especially in real estate deals. It's, it's a win-win or no deal. In other words, if, you know, and really when I was an attorney, uh, and Josh, you, and all the other attorneys know, from law school they teach you to think from the other side, just like a coach does in football, right? You think about what the other side so you can react to it. So, in other words, how can it be a win for them but also get what I want? Mm -hmm. uh, in the deal, and I think sometimes uh, a lot of the millennials just want to win, and uh, everybody can win. Now you can, you still want to come out ahead for your client, no yes. question. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it's just something. And the biggest thing here is uh, also on the flip side of that is all of our other folks need to understand that aren't millennials of how to profile and talk to that millennial, understand what they're wanting. Mm. And have a little patience with them. They have a bigger picture than we do. Oftentimes, they want to be part of groups uh, and have a common cause, maybe. Uh, and so, it's just a a, a, uh, a little bit different thing we've been dealing with in the last couple of years. So, um, I know we wanted to move on and talk about seller concessions uh, in a okay contract. How that affects the mortgage process? Yeah. Um... All right, so one of the one of the things we look at when when we're putting together estimates, okay, mm -hmm. we've got closing costs and prepaid items. Um, a lot of times, cash is obviously 
a concern. Okay, so how much cash do we have to work with? Well, when we've just got enough to cover the down payment, a lot of times we'll get the seller involved and see if they can help us out with closing costs and prepaids. So the way we do that is we just write it into the contract. It's going to be you know part of the negotiation. So if the house is, uh, you know, if the sales price is two hundred thousand and everybody has to agree on two hundred thousand, the buyer's cool with two hundred, the seller has to have two hundred. Two hundred is our number, and we still need closing costs. Then we would bump it to two hundred five and ask for five back from the seller. That's pretty much how it works. Um, now, just some generic information on conventional loans. The, the seller's allowed to contribute from 3% up to 9%. 9%. Is that, that's, that's, I've never seen. That, that's crazy. 9% is going to be a, a whole lot. It's going to have to be a, a really small purchase. Let price. me ask you this. Where that's going to be beneficial, though, is oftentimes we get asked about carpet allowance, those type things. And if you're asking, if you need 3% for purposes of closing costs, and then they want to give you a a carpet allowance and you're capped at 3%, you're in trouble. The seller cannot give you any more than that. So that is very beneficial when that situation comes up and we can move more money over to them, correct? Right, right. But we have to use the money for, uh, you know, um, closing costs and prepaids. So there wouldn't be a carpet allowance. See, okay. So that brings the point that that we got to have enough. And then the carpet allowance that they everybody likes to talk about is going to need to be paid differently because you're not going to get the whole amount paid to the carpet or whatever yeah, you're trying to do. Yeah, Jill Fouts. Hey, hey, welcome in. Good to see you. Um, but yeah, so you're not going to get that. But on an FHA loan, it's going to be about 6%. VA is 4%. Now, the items that the, t- the seller typically pays in the state of Alabama are half attorney and half title. Okay, so the reason I wanted to talk about this today is because I've had a couple of contracts lately where... Uh, the understanding of what those seller concessions were going towards. Okay, so typically as a buyer, you've got when you when your cash to close is going to be three things: your closing costs, your down payment, okay. and your prepaid items. Okay? okay, so that money from the seller can go towards your closing costs and prepaid items. All right, and I'll get into those a little bit more. But you've got to be pay attention to what. All right, there. sorry about that. A little bit of interruption. Yeah, sorry about that. All right, so um, we're looking at, typically in Alabama, the seller is going to pay for half the attorney and half the title. Okay, now another thing that's in the contract that's optional is a home warranty. So uh, just pay attention to how that's set up. Typically, I will say, let's say if it's $5,000, I'll say the seller is willing to contribute $5,000 towards the buyer's closing costs and prepaids not to include their half attorney and title. And by what I mean by that, so if, if there's $5,000 and your closing costs are 3,000, prepaids are 2,000, then we're, we're, we're a wash, right? 5, we're a wash, from yeah, seller, absolutely. 5,000 from you, so you're 0 and zero. However, if you're not paying attention, and, and let's say the half attorney and title's 1,000, but that's included in what the seller's given you, and the home warranty's 500 and that was included, then we got $1,500 that has not been accounted for, that both sides are not in agreement on. It's because of the verbiage in the contract. Absolutely. And if we don't catch it up front and early enough, we get to closing, and there is definitely some upset people. And what now? And the the idea is that they thought they were getting all this money, and then on the seller side, though, is that that's where the lender's protecting you. Well, is that you're not going to yeah, get? Yeah, and and I'll tell you, there are plenty of situations where, uh, let's say, the buyer has eight or nine thousand dollars. And their cash to close with their down payment is right. eight or nine thousand. We don't have room for another thousand. I see it happen all the time. We don't have that room, so we've got to understand uh, what we're negotiating in that contract so everybody's on the same page. Well, and that and that comes down to the realtor. I mean, really, the realtor's responsible for that, and that's one of the reasons that I think that you need that. Well, whoever your agent is. You need to have a good relationship with a lender. You know, one of the things I'll tell you about that is by your agent having a relationship, it doesn't mean that you have to use that agent. That a or that not that agent, obviously you're using them at that point. But what and I think when there's a strong relationship between agent and lender, I think that it's gonna prove to you that there's a benefit for that synergy between agent and lender. Because guess what happens on Saturday night? You need something, or you need a a very, uh, because you're in a multiple offer situation, you need your offer to be written correctly. Is that lender going to be able to get on the phone with you? 
Because yeah. if you're calling a rocket, they're not going to be there on Saturday night or Sunday. Yeah, and it's a, it's an accountability piece too because uh, you know if you and I are working together with a buyer, you know we'll, we we we're going to see each other next year and the next year and the next year. I mean, we we have a relationship, so I'm accountable to you that's right. um, on 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 another level rather than a guy that's <laughs> How strong. The, a guy that's uh, uh, Touche. working in another state might might check out at five o'clock um, and and be done for the day. And uh, you know when it gets down to the wire and there's there's because believe me, are there any problems in this business? In Absolutely, the last week? every every day. In the last week, we have we have issues come up. If you don't have somebody that that you can count on to go to bat for everybody involved and still pull it out of the fire, even though there's problems, and not make excuses, I think that's a big deal. I, I, I think it really. You're right, Mario. <laughs> uh, he said, "How strong?" That's funny. <laughs> I don't know what he was uh, asking about that relationship. He's what he's saying. There we go. Oh, uh, that's funny. Uh, and then. What you know? Also on concessions, talk a little bit about uh, what happens in that situation. Is uh, is money supposed to change hand outside of the closing? No, of course not. We don't ever know about that. Here's what happens. So uh, we really try to catch it up front, okay? Um, but if it, let's say it's the last minute, then it's it's going to have to. It's going to be a, an attorney call. The attorney is going to. Um, uh, determine the verbiage of the, how the contract reads. It's up to him now. Yeah, it's, it's, up, it's up to the attorney. And then if there is still a disagreement, you know, everybody might have to come together and say, "Look, we didn't understand it this way. You didn't understand it that way." Um, they could they could still negotiate it, but you know, it, it, well, it and could be a mess. And David, you know, it, it, one of the biggest uh, pet peeves I have is agents that will put just. I know you said three percent. I get that three percent is a big number, but we all deal in in the real world. We don't deal with percentages. We deal with numbers, and I think that for everyone's sake, we want to see a raw number there. So every time you counter that offer, and it was supposed to be say three percent of a hundred thousand, it needs to be three thousand. Now it goes up a little bit, so now it's thirty one hundred. It needs to be a fixed number. Because I think we don't think in terms of percentages, and the average person does not certainly uh, think in terms yeah, of. Yeah, it could it could definitely make it easier if it's round numbers. I but, mean, I think I think your seller, you know, could could understand what their net is a little bit, a little bit better. Well, that's right. Because remember, we've talked about it before. A seller only cares about one thing, and that is the net number. You know, uh, how is the commission calculated again? Uh, uh, on a fixed number, no, it's, it obviously is a... Uh, yes, that's a great question, Mario. And I think, um, and sellers get worried about that because they don't want to adjust that that uh, commission price, right? Because the, the, the sales price is what we base that off. A lot of times, if we if we agree on the 200, like the example earlier, we agree on the 200,000, we base commissions off of that, even though we bump it to 205 and then get five back. So instead of basing the commissions off the 205, you base it off the 200. I think a lot of people typically work that out. Is that right? It can be worked out. Uh, obviously, most of the time, most of the time it's actually not. Uh, but now, it, a lot of times, if it's negotiated in, it, it, it certainly is, right? Yeah. Uh, it's up for the agents involved, or really their customers also, uh, to talk about that. There is a situation, though, I think, where, where that comes into play, is whether or not it was the original way we were handling it, or if the lender comes back in and says, "Hey guys, I need to build five thousand into it to make I think, it work." I think whether it was the way it started, yeah. If it started at say two hundred five and five, we're going to calculate it off the two hundred five. But if the lender comes in and says two hundred, but I need five thousand, go yeah. ahead and give it. I think that's a different story. Uh, does that answer your question, Mario? Um, it is a little crazy. Yeah, sometimes that can be that can be a, a question. Uh, that sellers have in uh, on how to handle that. All right, uh, we're going to get into our what we call our D block here. The last part here before we get into craziness. By the way, good beer, UFO White Ale. The UFO Whites uh, today for the show. Yep, there you go. Uh, where are they from? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But you know what? I just wanted to mention, uh, I should have mentioned this before our relaxed block, but, you know, this is the real estate happy hour. And the reason, you know, we, we, we kind of sit back, we want to give you some information. And, you know, just talking earlier, it was the, the message was relaxed, right? Everything is pretty good. Yeah. Right? Everything's good. Chill. Yeah. We, rates are moving up. There's, there's not a lot of inventory. That's okay. 
you know, more people are working, they're making more money. Uh, you get some tax cuts, just relax. Tax cuts. Oh, we're all getting taxed. It's yeah. going to be huge. Yeah. Huge. huge. Yes. That's right. And uh, if you're in the steel business, I'm sorry today. Looks like uh, he hit you over the head that today. So yes. Anyway, uh, the t I don't know if you can read this. Let's see here. This is something that we share with our clients, and we just thought we'd go over it because it, it actually is one of the few things that is applicable to you and your clients, my clients, everybody. It's the Ten Commandments because you know we're real big on the Ten Commandments here in Alabama. Uh, but this is the Ten Commandments of buy, when you're buying or selling a home. Yes. We're not buying or selling or applying for a mortgage. Yes. And I'll just start with the first one. Thou shalt not become self-employed or quit your job once you've started the process. David, why? Yeah, hopefully we would. Uh, some of these would make sense. And really, if you're selling your house, we really don't care if you quit your job. But if you're buying yeah. a house <laughs> and we're trying to lend you money based on your income, it's nice for you to keep that income. So we can determine that you are able to repay the loan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, what happens when somebody has? Like, I have a client right now who is literally, uh, quite probably going to be quitting a job and starting a new one. What What's the situation like there? Hey, Larry. Yeah, that that situation can depend completely on what type of job they're moving from and to how they're getting paid. If it's the same type of work, if they're salaried, and everything is is pretty straightforward and easy to document, then we could usually close that loan shortly after they start the new job. So they have to have a, a paycheck? Pay Typically, we've got to have a paycheck with verify employment. Um, if you're moving from a W-2 job to commission self-employed, probably looking at two years. So there, Whoa, there's, there's- Two years? Yeah, two years. So there's, Who can wait two years? Somebody moving from a W-2 <laughs> to a commission. So, so if you're, you love the job that much, you're waiting two years. And you're getting granny to yeah. uh, get co-sign, will you? Yeah, you're doing, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, obviously people make these changes and maybe they're not in the process of buying a house. I mean, it's, right. it's no big deal to make a change outside of this. But yeah, we're trying to verify income and make sure you can pay the loan back. Obviously, it's impossible to, to calculate income three weeks into a commission job. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Thou shall not buy a car, truck, or van. Why do, why do we include van? What are we on? Like, I remember in Chips when yeah. they used to have the little we van. Gotta add, we got to add SUV, a yeah. cargo van. Cargo a, van. A box truck. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you may find yourself living in it. Why is that important? Well, you know, this is, this is important because, you know, we're, we're looking at your income. We're typically working off of uh, 40 to 45% of that gross income number. Okay, so if we're real close to that number already, we don't want to add a $500 car payment in there. And why don't I want to go take all that cash that I have sitting in the bank and buy a car for cash at that time too? But you're going to be looking at that, right? Yeah, we'd rather, we'd, we, the file would look better um, with $20,000 sitting in the bank. Right, right. You, you would look more attractive as a borrower <laughs> than having that shiny car in the driveway. Right. All right. well, hopefully that makes sense. All right, thou shall not go to Rooms to Go or any other furniture store uh, with yes. the money you've set aside for closing. Yes. So, or open lines yeah. of credit. So if we verify that you have ten thousand dollars and we need it all at the closing table, and you go turn it into furniture, therefore you can't bring it to the closing table. It happens all the time. I mean, David, this happens all the time. It's going to be difficult. Here, here's the problem. Women go to rooms to go. The men go to the car, get a new truck. Yes. Or it happens all the motorcycle. time. Motorcycle. Motorcycle. Yes. Uh, boat. Now, the other the other part of some of this is, is getting your credit pulled. And even at the furniture, you could finance some furniture and have a payment, too, that would, but would they mess said, up our numbers. But it, and here's what happens at the furniture store. Well, this won't... If you don't take anything out, don't worry about it. We won't, we won't uh, charge you until after the fact. What's yeah. the problem there? Since uh, oh, you're not getting charged yet. It's the pull, right? Yes, it's the credit pull. They're still going to pot. They're still going to hit your credit. Now, even if they hit your credit, we see it. Even if they mm -hmm. haven't put the information on there, then we have to go get the information, which would be the balance of the monthly payment. So even though you haven't started making payments, we're still going to hit you with it because we know you're going to be making it in the future. All right, thou shall not use credit cards excessively or fall behind and get thirty days late on. Oh, there's credit Cassie card. Mingle, there. Mingle Tiger. <laughs> Straight from Wisconsin. Um, so, she, Cassie, we're going, over, we're going over the Ten Commandments. No, she's in Georgia. All right, so Ten Commandments. No, no, don't use credit cards excessively or let your accounts fall behind. Obviously, falling behind, they're just going to hurt your credit. And using excessively is going to hurt your credit. So, 
what we're looking at is when we originally pull credit, we just want everything to look similar. Okay, so if you've got, uh, hey there, so if you've got you know ten thousand dollar uh, revolving balance, then let's just let's keep it there. Let's don't bump it up to thirty thousand because that's going to change your your potentially your credit and uh, your payment. So. Those are negative things. Yeah, especially during the process. Just leave it alone during the process. Yeah. Let's just get through. through the loan. Let's get the loan closed, and then you go do whatever you want. This is your favorite, I know. Thou shalt not omit debt, debts or liabilities from your loan Man, application. Man, this one's funny. Um, it's very difficult to do this. I don't know what type of debts. Uh, I know some people have, like, uh, cell phone bills that we don't, we don't count that. Um, but if you have your credit pulled and you extend credit, uh, it, it with, with these things we've already talked about, usually we see that, and so it's kind of hard to omit debts and liabilities. It's, but it's still possible. Well, and I equate it to my mother. All right, y'all are gonna find out we're, we're one gonna way or the other. Out. And so and that's it's the not best. Helping. Oh, that's the best part. I, I talk to people all the time, and they're like, "Well, we'll, we'll get it there. We'll get the cash there," or. Um, you know, or they, they try to to maneuver their way around the situation and figure it out on their own. We're going to figure it out. We're going to find it. We're going to uncover it. So if you don't bring it up early, it could make things hard. Gotcha, gotcha. And, you know, thou, and I promise you, we're getting to, we have 10 commandments, so we're almost there. Uh, thou shall not stop paying your rent or current mortgage. Again, some of these things should be obvious. <laughs> okay. Anything that, really? anything that would make it look like you are less likely to repay this loan. <laughs> you, is, hold on, you're telling good. me if I if I didn't pay my current mortgage, y'all are worried? A good rule of thumb. So if you stop paying your rent, <laughs> somebody might get upset wow. and tell us about it. If you stop paying your current mortgage, somebody might get upset and tell us about it. So, yeah. <laughs> and it will affect you in other areas. Because remember, in the home buying process, insurance is pulling credit, right? So yes. you're going to get hit at they pull every an insurance step. score, which is based on your credit. Yeah. But my point is, yes. it's going to be expensive yeah. all the way around. Yeah, it's going to hit you. Any thou shalt not originate any inquiries on your credit. What are we talking about? Inquiries are going to be when you're looking for uh, other things that you need your credit pulled for, like uh, boats, furniture, TVs, Oops, uh, cars, things like that. They're going to pull your credit. We're going to see that they pulled it. We're going to ask you, hey, uh, we saw that you were down at uh, Town & Country Ford last week. Had your, <laughs> had your credit pulled. What'd you do there? Yeah, hey, I bought a car. And then when they look at us like a deer in headlight, we're like, hmm. How'd you know? You're going to have to tell us about it. Okay? So then we're after going to get the agreement on the car, the balance, the monthly payment. All it's that just not stuff. worth it. Yeah, we're going to figure it out. Thou shall not, this happens occasionally, thou shall not co-sign a loan for anyone. By the way, there's my mother. During the process. Hey, Patsy. <laughs> How you doing? During the process, yeah, don't co-sign on any loans. It goes back to the same thing as getting new debt on your in your own name. Now you're adding debt for somebody else, but it's still going to hit you too because you co-sign on a loan. When you co-sign, you are also uh, liable for the debt. So, Abs so absolutely. If somebody, even if somebody else is paying it and they don't stop paying it, then you got to pay it. So we got to think about it. And, and we got to think about it. If you're if you're a parent with a kid that's going into college. And you're going to co-sign a loan. It happens all the time. You need to really think through that and see if there's other ways for you to back that child up so that we don't encumber everything. Yeah. Hey, Sadia. Oh no, she's admitting uh -oh. she co-signed on the first car. Uh oh. oh that Here didn't we go. That didn't happen. True. I don't. I don't think. The truth uh, is coming. I paid it back. Uh, all right, we got two more. Yep. Thou shall not make large deposits without checking with your loan officer. All right, this one happens all the time. We got people with with mattress money. Okay. Uh, they got $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 cash. I, I swear, I closed a loan last month. And when I first started talking to this girl, probably three months ago, I hope she doesn't check in, but uh, <laughs> she had some like $30,000 cash that she'd been sitting at hey. her parents' house for like 18 months. It happens all the time. And I was like, what are, why do you not have that in some type of account? Yeah. Anyway. If we don't know where it came from, we can't source it. That's right. Then, then we're we're assuming that you probably went out and borrowed it or took it off a credit card or something weird. We don't know where it came from. We can't use it, and, and people have a tough, really tough time with that. Why can't you use cash? It's the easiest form of currency. We just we can't. And but the easiest way to handle that is gift letters and things like that. Correct. That's where, possible. 
That we need to be possible. careful. We can, that. we can get a gift from somebody else, but just don't don't do that because if you don't tell me about it, then it's going to show up, and then we're going we're not going to be able to count it in, in your balances. Hey, now this is something that I'm as guilty as anybody is is because I'm always trying to play the interest game, like which gives me more interest. Shall thou shall not change bank accounts or transfer funds back and oh, forth. This one's awesome. Uh, let me tell you, when we get bank statements, okay, and we see transfers to from account A to account B, right? We got to get account B, right? Because we got to make sure it's yours. So then we get account B, and then there's transfers in that one from B to C and D, and then we go to C and D, and then there's transfers back. I mean, this can get really, really be a mess. So how would you like it if I asked you for fifty, like two months of fifteen different accounts? Right. You would hate me no that's yeah wasn't right now because now you've got to line them all up and make sure oh well that money was coming yeah. here oh. It's, oh and it happens more than people think because yeah. there's a lot of people that set it and forget it and there's other people like me that are chasing an extra quarter percent of interest in one month yeah you know you know what would be awesome is <laughs> almost another dollar. almost like a, a 12 month uh pre-game mortgage so let's let's move Test all it out. Let's move all of your money into one account, you know, so right. we can set it up maybe three, four months before. Let's make sure our credit's ready. Let's, you know, do a couple of things to make the process easier, huh? That'd be, that'd the, be interesting. It would, absolutely anything little, to make a this little process mortgage easier. Free game. Absolutely. Well, uh anything on the horizon with interest rates as we go Man, into the new week? Yeah, that was fun. Um you know what I think we're we're definitely saw a hit to the stock market late today with the uh with the steel uh, news from from President Trump, so we'll see how that resonates through the markets the next um, week. But you know, our projection is for five percent by the end of the year. We're already at four and a half. That's right. So, and it's March first. I mean, it's basically we're two months in. So we've we've come a long way in a short amount of time. I would hope that it's going to calm down a little bit and and be more of a slower steadier move through the rest of this year. So to answer your question, I'm hoping that it smooths out a little bit, even though we're still going to continue on that uh, trajectory up. One thing to also remember is that, as you know what's really crazy, is that negative news equals good news in the mortgage rate department typically. When war broke out, things like that, we saw rates go down. We went inverse to the market. The market see, takes yeah, off. And see what happens, see, when rates come down, it, it, it puts money back into the consumer's pocket, right? It makes borrowing money cheaper. Mm -hmm. So it helps the consumer and the consumer is the one we need to drive the economy. So yeah, when negative things happen, we don't want negative things to happen per <laughs> se, obviously. Yes. And, and but huh. but you know what we talked about early in the show was that good things are happening and that's why rates are having to move up to offset so we don't get out of control, out of out of hand to the other side this time. So so yeah, what you what you said was correct. All right. Well, have a good week and hope everybody yes. out there has a good week. We will see you next week at what time? Four o'clock. On Thursday. Thank have, you, guys. Have a great week. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.